it's very nice to see all of you. Uh, my name is Tom Locke, and I'm honored to serve as the interim director of the Center for Presidential History, while our founding director, Jeff Engel, is away on a richly deserved uh, sabbatical this semester, although he's with us in the audience tonight. So let me welcome you to this, our inaugural event for the 2015-2016 academic year and the beginning of the fourth year of the center. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I also want to say thanks before we get underway to our friends at the George W. Bush Presidential Library and thanks as well to the Office of the Provost at SMU which makes this enterprise possible. I also want to say that we're delighted tonight that Franklin Roosevelt's granddaughter, Chandler Lindsley, is with us this evening and I'd like to make, ask uh, Mrs. Lindsley to stand up and take a bow. I also would like to express my personal thanks to Jeff and Ron Spitz and Brian Franklin for all the help they've given me since I entered upon my responsibilities as the center's interim director. Um, I imagine some of you have your uh, DVRs and TiVos going to record the debate tonight, uh, but we're really glad that you're here. And I just thought I might mention that tomorrow morning on Fox for a Good Day, uh, Jeff will be commenting on tonight's Republican debate, so you might want to tune in if you can. Before I introduce tonight's program and my co-panelists, James Sparrow and Matthew Dalek, I'd like briefly to draw your attention to some of our other events coming this fall. On Tuesday, October 6th, we're co-sponsoring with the Coleman Center for Southwest Studies and the George W. Bush Presidential Center, a lecture by Jan Jarbo Russell, who's the editor of Texas Monthly, whose topic will be The Train to Crystal City. This is a talk on her new book, which is about uh, FDR's secret prisoner exchange program and America's only family internment camp during World War II. On October 15, the Center for Presidential History will present Evan Thomas, who is the former editor of Newsweek, and he'll be talking about his new book on the 37th President of the United States, Richard Nixon, the book title being Being Nixon, A Man Divided. Um, on October 27, we're bringing to campus Catherine Clinton, who is a noted historian of American women, the South, and the Civil War, and she'll speak on what she calls Mary Todd Lincoln's assassination. This is part of our continuing series on First Ladies, and you won't want to miss this one. Finally, on December 9th, we're presenting Kirsten Wood of Florida International University, who's going to explore music and politics in the early republic, and the event will feature actual musical performances by students from the Meadows School for the Performing Arts. I won't go into any detail about next semester, but I'll just say that we're offering a wide variety of presentations on such subjects as Woodrow Wilson, George McGovern, Lyndon Johnson, and Thomas Jefferson, so you'll want to keep an eye out for, for those. In part because 2015 is the 70th anniversary of the passing of Franklin Roosevelt, tonight our subject is the Roosevelt's World War II and the origins of big government. And to explore the nature of government expansion during history's greatest struggle and the part that Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt played in that development, we have two very distinguished scholars, my co-panelists. First, James Sparrow teaches at the University of Chicago, he's closest to me here, where he also serves as Associate Dean of the College. James is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and he earned his PhD at Brown University where he studied with James Patterson, one of the great political historians of the 20th century. His teaching and research focus is cultural and political history, war and society, and the concept of social citizenship. His current project is titled The New Leviathan, Sovereign America, and the Foundations of the Rule of Rule in the Atomic Age. This is a study in politics and intellectual history that examines the idea and uh, exercise of the idea of sovereignty as it evolved in U.S. internet 
international relations during the Cold War. Um, now, when I tell you the title of his previous book, his first, which was published about four years ago, you'll understand why, why he's here on this panel tonight. The book's title is Warfare State, World War II, and the Age of Big Government, and it's garnered terrific reviews. The Journal of Foreign Affairs, for example, has called it, quote, one of the most important books on the United States to be published in some time, unquote. Another reviewer described it as beautifully written, wonderfully insightful, and a must read for all interested in the nature and scope of American governance. And still another one <clears throat> declared the study among the seminal works of modern American political history. Matthew Dalek teaches in the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University. He majored in history at the University of California, Berkeley, and for his PhD, he went on to Columbia, where he worked with Alan Brinkley, who's also a true giant in the field of 20th century political history. Along with being a historian, Professor Dalek has been a freelance journalist, and his articles have appeared in The Atlantic, The New Republic, Politico, Slate, uh, The Washington Post, uh, you, you get the idea. At GW, he teaches courses on political leadership and the presidency. His first book, The Right Moment, Ronald Reagan's First Victory and the Decisive Turning Point in American Politics, is the definitive study on a crucial watershed, watershed in the future president's career. That is, of how in 1966, Reagan, then a political novice, managed a landslide victory over incumbent Pat Brown in California. California's gubernatorial race. Said the New York Times, it succeeds admirably in tracing the very roots of the Reagan, of the Reagan Revolution, while the Washington Times praised, it, praised the compelling page-turning quality of Mr. Dalek's writing. Built on prodigious research, observed the Chicago Tribune, the right moment represents political history at its best. And tonight, he'll be talking about his current project, an exploration of Eleanor Roosevelt's exertions on behalf of a wartime New Deal and her aspirations for America's role in post-war international relations. The working title is Defenseless Under the Night, the Roosevelt Years, and the Origins of Homeland Security. You know, even after seven decades, FDR remains, I think, for most Americans, the father of big government. A new school of thought, however, now argues that the Second World War exerted a far greater impact than the New Deal on how the federal government came to exercise its expanded role in the life of the nation, a legacy that still affects politics and our politics and society to this day. We decided that to establish the fullest context for this panel, we needed at the outset to devote just a few minutes to the New Deal itself as a point of departure for the larger discussion about wartime. And that's my assignment this evening. Now, moreover, the era of the Great Depression really does put our problems since 2008 into perspective. There are hardly any aspects of those times that do not contain insights for us today. And I have to say, too, that in teaching the second half of the U.S. survey here at SMU, that's uh, the United States from Reconstruction to the present. Students have never seemed quite so interested in the 1930s as they've been in the past few years. Our economic woes now seem to be about over, and unemployment is down to 5.1. But the Great Depression, you know, lasted a full decade. In 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt took the oath of office, unemployment had reached 14 million, or 25% nationally. By then, the country's industrial production had shrunk to 54% of, of its 1929 level. The automobile industry manufactured one-fifth of the cars that it had manufactured in 1929, and the steel industry was operating at 12% of its capacity. Moreover, no sector of the economy suffered more than agriculture. From 1929 to 1933, gross national farm income had fallen from $12 billion to $5 billion. There were other ways to calibrate the effects of the Depression, particularly for younger people. 
like our undergraduates. For example, there were 300 fewer marriages, 300,000 fewer marriages in 1933 than in 1939 and uh, 29. That's a decline of 25% in that four year period. And for the first time since 1790, the birth rate went down from 21 per thousand to 18 per thousand. And of course, college enrollments had fallen precipitously. As for other measurements, inside the newly completed Empire State Building, 25 stories of vacant office space went unrented, and the New York Yankees gave Babe Ruth a 10% salary cut. <laughs> when, he, when he complained, the managers told him he was still making more than President Hoover, to which the babe replied, yeah, but I had a better year than he did. <laughs> which gets us to Herbert Hoover on whom everyone seemed to blame everything. Despite his failure, Hoover was not a do-nothing president. In his last year in office, he spent more money to combat the Depression than Franklin Roosevelt spent in his first year. In 1932, Hoover established the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which loaned hundreds of millions of dollars to banks, railroads, and other businesses that simply could not be permitted to collapse. And he signed another bill that set up a fund of $750 million in gold to help the banks cope with the surge of withdrawals from overseas. Does any of this sound familiar? Just a little, yeah. Um, Hoover's initiatives represented the first such federal intervention into, in the economy in peacetime history. Even so, it was a case of too little, too late, and he balked at federal relief for the unemployed. And to everyday Americans, he seemed to care more about banks and corporations than he did about families out of work and hungry. Franklin Roosevelt actually continued Hoover's programs and priorities, but he had a fuller grasp of the magnitude of this crisis, and he knew instinctively that the nation needed to be assured that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. In the first 100 days, Roosevelt signed legislation to restore people's confidence in the banking structure, then a second act to ensure individual savings accounts and to separate investment banks from commercial banks. One of the biggest challenges the New Deal faced was this enormous backlog of unsold goods and mountains of unsold agricultural commodities. The New Deal responded by setting up mechanisms to prevent, uh, to provide private manufacturers and farmers with the tools to control these disas this disastrous output. Overproduction was only half the problem, however. It took a couple of years, but Roosevelt eventually realized that the Depression could never be halted unless the New Deal also addressed underconsumption, the other side of the coin. That meant somehow getting some money into people's pockets in order to stimulate demand, in order to prime the pump, break the cycle. In the circumstances, the government would have to put a lot of unemployed people to work at least temporarily. And by mid-decade, some three to four million Americans had jobs with the WPA. Suffice it to say that the New Deal was both reform program and what today we might call a stimulus package. What did the New Deal accomplish? Well, we all know that it didn't end the Depression. The World War II accomplished that. But the New Deal did more than simply get the country through the crisis until the war came along. And it was greater than the sum of its parts, and it changed practically everything. Because of the New Deal's banking legislation, Americans thenceforth would be free of this elemental fear of having their savings accounts wiped out overnight. Neither would they have to worry so much about their parents falling on the hard times as retirement age approached because of Social Security. The Wagner Act and Fair Labor Standards Act secured for blue-collar workers the right to organize unions and bargain collectively and a minimum wage. The New Deal also took steps on behalf of those who fed the factory workers. In 1933, barely 20% of the nation's farms had electricity. 
the Rural Electrification Administration quadrupled that number in a decade, while major agricultural legislation established crop insurance, price supports, federal storage facilities, in effect transforming country life in America. The New Deal as well befriended suburbanites trying to hold on to middle class status by guaranteeing mortgages, home mortgages, which not incidentally benefited banks and the construction industry. And no less significant, both at the time and for the future to this day, were those massive public works projects which created jobs for almost one third of the nation's unemployed. By 1940-41, workers in these programs had constructed literally tens of thousands of bridges and public buildings, including hospitals and airports and courthouses and schools, and nearly 500,000 miles, a half a million miles of new roadways, not to mention a network of TVA dams and improved harbors. And so from manufacturing, retailing, and high finance to textiles, transportation, and real estate development, these programs exerted a tremendous salutary effect upon virtually every area of the economy. Most historians will tell you that the New Deal saved American industrial capitalism. And in so doing, it also made the economic system both more dynamic and more humane. And in tandem with the repercussions of the vast wartime expansion and the GI Bill, the New Deal had bequeathed to its children the essential civil works infrastructure, so to speak, upon which they would build the previously elusive American dream. Now, I might not have made these remarks with quite this kind of emphasis if these were the times of Ronald Reagan or the times of Bill Clinton, for that matter, but in this decade, to revisit the United States in the 1930s is edifying and instructive, and FDR and the New Deal aren't relevant once again. Yet, as you're going to see, there's a lot more to understanding the origins of big government than I've suggested. In a broader sense, all of what you're going to hear tonight illustrates what history itself, in part, is. What is history? Well, it is the record of what people of the past said and did, but there are other things for us to apprehend. That history is a matter of both fact and interpretation, that individuals and uncontrollable forces alike shape what happens, and that history is the dynamic interaction of the past, present, and future, and therefore its main meaning is changing all the time. Well, that's my brief refresher course on the New Deal, and I'd like to turn things over now at this point uh, to James Sparrow. Well, thank you very much for that uh, stimulating and helpful overview, Thomas. Um, before I get started, I, I would like to thank the center and Jeffrey Engel for inviting me here and for um, uh, to uh, thank Thomas for uh, being such a, a genial host. We've um, had a lovely uh, tour of this magnificent campus and it's uh, been quite an extraordinary uh, visit. Well, it's common to think of Franklin Delano Roosevelt as a great communicator, on par with Lincoln before him and Reagan afterwards. But Roosevelt's mastery of mass politics derived um, not only from his eloquent rhetoric, but from the government he helped build. Across a range of modern media, from his infamously chatty and off-the-cuff and innovative press conferences, which we have uh, displayed up here, to, um, pardon me, let me pull up this keyboard, um, to his intimate fireside, radio, uh, fireside chats broadcast by radio. Here we see Eleanor and Mother Sarah arrayed around the fireside with Franklin. Um, across all media, Roosevelt's public addresses became major events, but his lofty rhetoric might otherwise have fallen on deaf ears and the bonds that he forged between government and people might have dissolved if it had not been for an extensive and a finely tuned institutional apparatus 
that assisted him in finding the pulse of the people so that his messages could find their mark. It would not have been possible to mobilize the American people for victory in World War II without this organizational matrix because not only did it get the message out, but it habituated Americans to a government that was far larger and more demanding than anything they'd ever seen. FDR had spent years building up an institutional foundation for what the New Dealers like to call education and information and what their enemies reviled as propaganda. <laughs> From the formative years of his political career onward, FDR demonstrated an exceptionally well-developed knack for taking the pulse of the people. This is something of a truism, and there's a history of his career that I talk about in my book, uh, going back to um, his uh, coming into politics uh, in, under the direction of Lewis Howe, the newspaperman who, uh, who was his main advisor from his Wilson days through the early years of the New Deal. But to jump forward to the late 1930s, early 40s, when the war started, and Roosevelt had been in, in, in office for some time, um, it was clear that this was not just an affectation or a style or a touch, but an institutional juggernaut. Uh, Roosevelt and, and Howe made the uh, mail a vital part of the administration's political communications and outward from that personal uh, epicenter, a, a modern uh, media structure and a modern structure of public opinion research grew up around it. Well, Right from the early days at the White House, a staff of 22 handled the vast influx of correspondence that came in upon Roosevelt's victory. It crested at almost half a million letters in Roosevelt's first week in office, uh, but soon settled down to more than 4,000 letters a week in ordinary times, higher and busier seasons when as many as 20,000 letters would come in each week um, and the staff would mushroom up to as many as 70. This compared to a staff of one in the Hoover uh, mailroom. The 15 million letters that remain on file in the FDR library actually is probably a small subset of, um, of, uh, of the letters that actually arrived in the government. I've certainly found thousands of them in other agencies as well. It was not just the spiking quantity of outpouring of public sentiment that mattered, but the way in which the mails were handled. How and uh, James Farley and Roosevelt's other aides trained the staff to respond to every letter, if you can imagine that, this is a new enterprise, uh, that was not completely negative, and to emulate the paternalistic, upbeat, engaged tone of the president in providing semi-customized responses. They also employed an extensive system of referrals to relevant agencies for actionable requests. So you could write to the government for something like relief and get an answer, and it would have gone through the White House. And sometimes the president or, um, or the president's wife, uh, whom we'll hear about later, would actually be part of the response. Um, now, uh, there were many uses of the mails. One of them became clear in the March of Dimes campaign in 1938 to fund uh, the search for the cure for polio. Um, and here you can see the uh, mailroom staffer going through um, uh, envelope after envelope uh, filled with dimes. This essentially broke the mails for a period of time and, um, and, and it didn't pose a threat to national security, but it did cripple the Capitol Hill's social calendar during the Christmas season. Um, and it really demonstrated quite vividly how direct, how personal, how intimate, this is one dime at a time that this campaign took place, how uh, intimate that connection was that Roosevelt was learning to forge with the public. Now, despite the availability of other more reliable mechanisms like polls, Roosevelt, Roosevelt had his own private pollster, Hadley Cantrill, on loan from uh, Princeton University during the war. But despite those, Ro Roosevelt continued to lean heavily on mails and on direct contact with the public in trips around the country. Every evening, a stack of 50 or so letters awaited his personal perusal by his uh, bedside, and often he would dictate the reply in person to the citizen who had written. <clears throat> On a weekly basis and after major speeches and events, Roosevelt received regular mail briefs that broke down the contents of mail by subject and separated out the obvious pressure campaign mail from the rest. So this is sort of cutting edge media practices. It sounds maybe even a little old fashioned to us now, but nobody had done this and nobody had integrated it so thoroughly into the machinery of how the government worked. These letters were forwarded to the WPA, to Social Security, to the Selective Service. Um, this was a way of taking uh, an impersonal bureaucracy and making it a personal institution. <clears throat> 
but it was also a feedback mechanism. And this is really critical to sort of the, the, the way that the, the big government operated. Uh, Roosevelt's practice of reaching out to the people and crafting his message in, in that way evolved into a much larger set of institutional practices that were designed not only to get the word out, but also to monitor and to mold public opinion. Uh, so not just inform, but to monitor. I don't have the time here to go through all of those institutional mechanisms, but what I can say is that they ranged from um, across er almost every agency. The National Recovery uh, Administration, for example, uh, um, urged local businesses to make a, a roll of honor pledge and to mail it into the federal government so the government could keep track of who would loyally uh, comply with the system of, uh, of, of price controls and industry standards the NRA sought to to, to foster. Roosevelt, during his radio addresses, would encourage his uh, his listeners to, to write into their uh, congressmen to pressure them to vote his way, which you might imagine didn't endear him to his opposition in Congress. The, uh, the New Deal maintained a centralized clipping service that monitored all news coverage of every uh, topic that might be relevant to the New Deal, continued this in the Office of War Information and into the State Department. Um, and, uh, and onward into the U.S. Information Agency, uh, clipping, analyzing, and tracking coverage by all groups, all uh, in, in all newspapers of U.S. foreign policy by the time of the late 1940s. Um, these clippings were not sent to Congress. Congress didn't get this kind of intelligence. So eventually this produced some trouble for the State Department uh, when, when they found out. Lorena Hickok um, famously uh, filed a number of reports with the White House traveling around the country um, and reporting on local compliance with the New Deal. The WPA conducted regular analysis of its mails, look, uh, breaking it down by regional analysis to pinpoint problems. In the Library of Congress, uh, a modern polling apparatus was established. This is some of the first scientific polls to gauge the, the pulse of the people. Uh, in my book, I have a chapter that talks about rumor control cl clinics that emerged in World War II out of this apparatus. These were clinics set up to debunk rumors, to take falsehoods that had been planted by Nazi saboteurs, and to inoculate the American public with the truth. Um, and these actually backfired. If you heard the inoculation, you were more likely to remember the rumor and the falsehood <laughs> than to actually learn, that, especially if it was on a radio program, in, in which case you were scanning the dial. But what these rumor clinics did was they taught people to be aware of what they said. You may be familiar with the phrase, loose lips sink ships. This is part of a larger security of information campaign to keep people from talking about the war effort so that saboteurs couldn't report it back to the Axis. This campaign produced, uh, encouraged thousands and thousands of citizens to write in transcripts of rumors uh, to Washington. And then Washington enlisted librarians, social workers, barbers, bus drivers to write down any rumor that they heard that sounded subversive and to send it into the federal government and to the centralized rumor control cl clinic, that uh, rumor control group that operated in the Library of Congress. So an elaborate network of rumor wardens, and um, uh, who produced these transcripts. Finally, the FBI co uh, contact program encouraged Americans all around the nation to report anything that seemed subversive. In fact, we have a latter-day version of this in the Office of Homeland Security. And it also um, produced a sort of a consciousness that um, citizens should watch what they say and they should report what they hear to the government. So this uh, communication with the public also involved training the public to think about its relationship to the government and to the war effort. There were also more uh, elaborately produced efforts to control the flow of communication. This is a team in the Department of Interior that worked on a radio play that was supposed to dramatize the President's 1939 budget message, which was just bristling with dynamism and, <laughs> and, <coughs> and sex appeal. Um, the, um, in, during the war, the thousands of letters that flooded into President Roosevelt in response to Pearl Harbor were dramatized in a similar way by a similar team. Um, and this helps you understand why some of the cultural programs of the New Deal, the WPA theater program, for example, um, was seen as a sort of a nest of radicalism for the conservative enemies of Roosevelt because it was clear how carefully crafted this uh, dialogue between the president and the, and the public was. It, uh, it really scared um, uh, conservatives who were opposed to Roosevelt. 
Well, in light of FDR's popularity and the crises of the Depression and the Global War, you may find yourself wondering, why was such an elaborate edifice of publicity necessary? And the answer lies in the challenge that Roosevelt faced in mobilizing not just his New Deal coalition, but really the entire nation by 1941, including the millions of them who increasingly were voting against him. The Americans whom FDR had to persuade had partook in a historic, sweeping transformation in the foundations of government. Internationally, American power leapt far beyond territorial bounds, inaugurating an era of globalism. Domestically, warfare replaced welfare as the central purpose of the national state. I can't overstate how profound this departure was. It even eclipsed that of the New Deal itself. Um, we, the United States embraced, uh, built a standing army, a defense establishment in peacetime, a peacetime draft. Uh, it initiated mass income taxation not long after Roosevelt had uh, insisted that taxation should apply to the wealthy, and mass ownership of long-term structural deficits, as well as long-term entangling alliances with the British, who were not terribly uh, popular, particularly in my part of the world, in the, in the Midwest in the 1930s. So more than in any period since the Civil War, changes in government were um, politicizing everyday life, touching nearly every American. And to give you a sense of how much of a departure from precedent this was, really even greater than um, uh, the expansion, even greater than the New Deal, I just want to quickly show you some charts. Um, uh, you, as you might expect, military personnel as a proportion of, of uh, the population increased dramatically after World War II. Um, that's not a surprise. But this is <coughs> federal employment, and here I'm talking about civilian employment, and not just civilian employment, but let's throw out the postal employees as well, who are a special part of federal employment, as a percentage of the labor force in the population. Um, so you see toward the end of the 30s there, that's the peak of the New Deal at its biggest, at its baddest for the conservatives. It looks like nothing compared with the lowest point after World War II. Um, uh, <coughs> Here's uh, federal personal income taxpayers as a percentage of the labor force and the population. Again, minuscule, almost non-existent. This era before 1940, 1941 is the era of class taxation in which really corporate income taxes were the main source of revenue. And then quickly, personal income taxes, which applied even to the working poor, uh, took their place and provided a much larger source uh, of revenue. So you see by these different indices, and I could go on, on almost infinitely here, the age of big government really starts in 1940. Um, and it is not to diminish the importance of the New Deal in the q and I'd be happy to talk about the, the absolute centrality of the New Deal, which we've, we've already heard about. But that sort of laid the groundwork, it set the institutional foundation for what then became a truly massive Leviathan. Um, so, this is all to say the activist state that was built in the 30s changed profoundly when its goals shifted from welfare to warfare. It took the Roosevelt administration some time to realize this. Much as one might retrofit an automobile factory to produce bombers, Roosevelt and his speechwriters retooled their ideological framework in the late 1930s and the early 1940s, portraying the com coming confrontation with fascism as if it were simply an international extension of reform principles, what the historian Liz Borgward has called a New Deal for the world. The Atlantic Charter and other visionary statements of the New Deal internationalism reflected this sensibility. But at the same time this was happening, the foundations for the, government, the government's legitimacy were shifting as well as the economy recovered, um, as well as, as the nature of the threat to the nation changed. And accordingly, FDR and the government um, adapted the imagery and the meanings of activist government to suit these new requirements of national interest. National interest now defined by military rather than economic security. And that really made all the difference for the, the nature of the big government that we got. To promote uh, national unity and full mobilization, government propagandists placed an emphasis on personal sacrifice. This was a strategy, strategy that emerged from early insight into uh, psychology of civilian morale. That vast research apparatus that I mentioned revealed 
then in fact, um, the best way to get citizens to go along with this new government to pay their taxes, for example, they didn't know how. They'd never filed a tax form before. It's difficult today. Imagine what it was like in 1943. Um, <clears throat> the best way to do this, to reach people and to get them to actually comply with their new obligations to, to, to help with the war effort, was to personalize it. And this also depoliticized it, or at least made it appear less political. Um, and so the best way to do this was to deploy what the art historian George Roediger has called the home front analogy. Sorry, George Roeder. And this home front analogy was uh, simply the pointed evaluation of every conceivable aspect of civilian life according to its contribution to the war effort, uh, tracing out the battlefront consequences of the smallest um, uh, decisions made on the home front, following the wisdom of the, of the folks saying, for the want of a nail, the war was lost. So in this rhetorical universe, where everything done on the home front had repercussions on the battlefront, defense workers were transformed into soldiers of production. Home gardens became victory gardens. Young women willing to socialize with soldiers were called victory girls. These are just little vignettes, but they capture a much larger logic that did, in fact, suffuse the home front. Um, and here you can see in this, um, and what's just uh, one example of a, of a broad and vast campaign to sell war bonds to Americans over, uh, they stopped counting once 75 to 80% of all Americans had purchased war bonds. It seems like they reached almost 100% saturation, including small children who, as this ad shows, bought them one stamp at a, at a time. It was possible for children to buy ammunition and guns and equipment uh, for soldiers' kits and put those kits in the hands of soldiers overseas by filling up their stamp books and then, um, and then purchasing uh, a gift. It was possible for schools to purchase a Jeep. Some large cities uh, um, purchased aircraft carriers, and, and so they could feel like they were directly contributing um, uh, to, the, to the fighting over, overseas. Roosevelt was especially effective in pursuing this, uh, this approach, building this bond, um, and drawing out this visceral moral bond between civilians and soldiers. In his fireside chat of April 28, 1942, which reached 70% of households, uh, urban households, he traced out the chain of national merit explicitly saying, there's one front and one battle where everyone in the United States, every man, woman, and child is in action and will be privileged to remain in action throughout the war. That front is right here at home in our daily lives, in our daily tasks. Roosevelt prodded his listeners' consciences with concrete examples that they could not help taking personally. The rhetorical device he employed was the visual, visualization of this moral exchange I'm talking about here, the wartime social compact between the soldier who offered the ultimate sacrifice, his life, and the civilian who reciprocated with a commitment to personal sacrifice and support of the soldiers. Roosevelt said, we're coming to realize that one extra plane or extra tank or extra gun or extra ship completed tomorrow, and for children, one extra bullet or one extra um, uh, poncho, may in a few months turn the tide on some distant battlefield. It may make the difference between life and death for some of our own fighting men. Um, so you can imagine how powerful that this equation was for uh, American civilians. <laughs> You'll just have to take my word, and I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A. There was abundant research suggesting this worked. This approach worked. However, it didn't work the way the government thought it would. Civilians selectively appropriated the message. They identified with the soldier and then felt that it uh, entitled them to national citizenship. Um, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the, uh, in the future, but it could also have a repressive effect that anyone could be criticized as somehow undermining the soldier. And then these uh, rumors and contacts reported to the FBI and the White House might mention that someone that, 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 that the, right, that the uh, correspondent knew was not fighting and maybe they had dodged the draft. Well, that was one of the main purposes of the FBI contact program was to locate over 300,000 Americans who hadn't registered for the draft. So there's a coercive side to this as well as uh, an, uh, sort of an identification that was produced. So the government subtly and quite unintentionally politicized everyday life by drawing connections between the battlefront and the home front so insistently. 
And I just want to give one example of war workers <coughs> who took this identification very seriously. Um, uh, they took their image as soldiers of production and the arsenal of democracy very personally. If you speak with anyone who has worked in a factory in the war, they still have this powerful identification. Just like the taxpayers and the bondholders, they conceptualize their moral link to the, home, to the fighting front by objectifying it in the war material that they send to the GIs. And in this picture, it looks as if they're handing it off right from the, from the factory floor um, to the deck of the ship. This identification fostered a sense of full citizenship. And after the war, workers would push for full employment rights, union rights, uh, and this would grow out of their wartime experience of overtime pay, um, uh, benefits, uh, fair employment, and opportunity. Um, but during the war, this expectation came at a great cost. Mounting demands that soldiers of production be forced to work or fight, in other words, to be sent to the draft if they struck, crested right alongside unauthorized wildcat strikes that many workers indulged as a symbolic protest of the wage caps and the managerial control that the war agencies imposed. Anti-labor sentiment crested right alongside that, uh, that wildcat uh, wave. And um, Roosevelt himself became convinced that a national service law was necessary. Indeed, he introduced a full-blown proposal for national service as the price that Americans should pay for his economic bill of rights. In other words, that their entitlement as citizens to full national citizenship should be paid for by an equal obligation that was comparable to the soldiers. In fact, his famous economic bill of rights speech spends much more time talking about the, the, the national service part than the bill of rights. By the time of his last fireside chat in 1945, Roosevelt had shifted from his depression-era emphasis on the derelictions of the wealthy to chastise workers who lay down on their essential jobs, exacting a price whose payment would have to be made in the, quote, lifeblood of our own sons. And once again, he urged Congress to adopt national service. And almost as an afterthought, he mentioned the Economic Bill of Rights. This is in January of 1945. This made patriotic unionists furious after hearing Roosevelt denounce striking mine workers in 43, one striker sputtered with rage, damn him, I ain't a traitor. Dickey was fighting for one thing, I'm fighting for another, and they ain't so far apart. His son had been killed in action in the Pacific. So you can see this is uh, Roosevelt's base, and, 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 and he's losing patience uh, with, uh, with the working class as a consequence of the unanticipated consequences of, these, uh, of this identification that he, in fact, had encouraged. This is Roosevelt at his crankiest. He was dying slowly, and he had grown impatient even with the stalwarts among his electoral base. But it showed how the logic that I've been talking about here of Americanism and entitlement could serve either master, Americanism or entitlement, depending on who held the reins in national politics and what needs the managers of the warfare state deemed most urgent. Now, from 1945 onward, this big government and the strong sense of citizenship that came from fighting the war did, in fact, allow for fuller claims of citizenship to be made, um, particularly for white male veterans, but actually for, for many, many groups within society. Uh, but the criterion now that was applied was that um, it could not compete with national interest. Uh, and, and this was a newly unitary conception, uh, an undisputed categorical notion of the national interest sanctified by the sacrifice of the soldier. Um, and this unleashed uh, a nasty sort of uh, counter-subversive politics. Um, I'm going to close with um, a suggestion of what the cost of this strong but militaristic conception of social citizenship and big government were for um, ordinary Americans. Um, this poster was, uh, was a part of this security of information uh, campaign that I, um, that I mentioned earlier. It was shown to soldiers outside the factory gates in New Jersey by the Office of War Information, which was doing research. And um, they were supposed to recognize that this was a German helmet. It was the enemy who was watching them, so they should keep quiet about production in war factories. Instead, the most common remark was they, the, the he who was watching them, they thought, was their manager. <laughs> The second, the second was the GI. So that's chilling too when you think about the identification of the soldiers with the, with, uh, with, with the GI. Um, this, uh, uh, the last image I'm going to leave you with was um, an entry in a competition to help support the security of information campaign. And um, 
and to try to encourage people not to, not to give away secrets. And you see here, what this conveys is an internalization, a self-censorship that really was one of the biggest byproducts of the war and would underwrite the politics of anti-communism after during and after the war. The sense, that, and it would also authorize uh, the violations of civil liberties that went along with it, particularly in the loyalty security apparatus that the FBI was uh, um, uh, most responsible for, along with other parts of the government. Um, so here what you have is a soldier uh, seeing himself really as the person who's endangered by loose talk, but also being reminded to scrutinize what he says and what he does. And this was part of the cost of this direct personal connection between, uh, between the government and the citizen. By enlisting citizens to monitor their own speech as well as that of their neighbors, and connect the consequences of mundane actions to the outcome of battles overseas, the government instilled not only acceptance but also faith in its surveillance. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and Roosevelt played a role on the policy level, on the policy side of this too, where he authorized Hoover to reactivate his central file of subversives in 1935, and he installed a machinery of loyalty oaths out of which the post-war loyalty structure uh, emerged. By bureaucratizing the grapevine in these rumors, for example, and sanctioning the politics of internal subversion, the FBI, the OWI, and the rumor clinics that I've mentioned bolster the legitimacy of one part of the government, the agencies associated with national security at the expense of others. Monitoring rumors serve to bolster government authority over public discourse without setting off alarm bells regarding the First Amendment. The government accomplished this feat even as it instructed Americans on the art of spying on their neighbors. This is a skill that would prove the raw material uh, for the anti-communist purges of the post-war period. And I just would close by pointing out that these purges were ironically aimed at, mostly at, communists in government. In other words, the officials of the big government that was now too central to national life to jettison, but was all too easy to scapegoat. Thank you very much. Thanks, that was uh, wonderful. And uh, I too want to just uh, echo what Jim said and uh, thank uh, Thomas and, and Jeffrey and, uh, and the center for uh, inviting me here and, and for your warm hospitality and for coming up with such a uh, terrific subject for us to talk about tonight. Uh, and thank you for coming out uh, on the night of uh, an important Republican debate. I appreciate you, uh, uh, you doing that. Um, so uh, I want to... Uh, pivot a little bit, but hopefully not too much, uh, talk about uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And in January uh, 1919, uh, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt visited Paris. Uh, she toured hospitals, visited uh, battlefields, and she said that, quote, what the men who fought there lived through is inconceivable. She saw women who had lost loved ones and who were uh, veiled in black. She concluded, ultimately, that the war idea, quote, is obsolete, and that World War I had proven that pacifism was the only sane path for the 20th century. But by 1938, almost two decades later, she had done an about face. She had become an anti-fascist who saw a fundamental responsibility of American go uh, government to defend the nation with force of arms. Uh, once when she visited her son James at Minnesota's Mayo Clinic where he was being treated uh, for ulcers, she and FDR boarded a train car to listen to uh, Hitler's radio address in which he threatened the invasion of the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt declared uh, that, quote, Hitler makes me sick. His militarism uh, and his bluster, his antipathy uh, uh, for God, and his utterly cavalier attitude toward human life was appalling to her. So nearly two decades after watching uh, progressive dreams of a, a post-war peace fizzle, at the end of World War I, Eleanor Roosevelt was rethinking the connection between national security, 
the role of government and democracy. And she regarded Hitler as a growing menace to the United States, a direct threat to the US, who had to be stopped militarily. It's true that Eleanor Roosevelt is uh, typically described as the conscience, uh, you, know, you hear that word a lot, the conscience of social domestic liberalism. The images we have are of her as a social settlement house worker, uh, advocate for the poor, an author, of course, of the UN's Declaration of Human Rights. She donated her own money to assist refugees and uh, pushed for many years uh, for social justice through federal programs. Her life is often told, and there have been a number of biographies written about her, her life's often told as a story of uh, the awkward, shy girl who used uh, uh, the terrible pain of her upbringing and her marriage to become one of the American century's leading champions of uh, equal rights. During the early New Deal, she fought for uh, uh, programs such as the National Youth Administration to give jobs to young people, uh, the National Labor Relations Act to give rights uh, to workers. She advocated for slum clearance to aid the poor and help win passage of the Federal Arts uh, Project to help struggling artists. And she visited uh, often coal mines and uh, sharecroppers' homes to draw attention to the plight of of the underprivileged. Uh, there are pictures of her uh, uh, in the slums in uh, Puerto Rico. And, uh, and so she traveled, she was really almost the, the kind of, seen as the eyes and ears, or you know, uh, some set of the eyes and ears of the President uh, of the United States and constantly reporting back to him about uh, uh, how people were faring uh, in the Depression. Uh, one member of FDR's brain trust recalled watching Eleanor Roosevelt sit in the Oval Office and tell the President things like, Franklin, I think you should, or Franklin, surely you will not. <laughs> and according to this aide, her determination and political savvy pushed the New Deal in countless uh, new directions that were very hard to even uh, quantify. Uh, another prevailing image is of her as an iconic liberal who fought for civil rights in an age where at a time when almost all New Dealers refused to challenge segregation. Uh, in 1939, uh, most famously, when the Daughters of the American Revolution denied a request to have African-American singer Marian uh, Anderson perform at its Constitution Hall in Washington, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt publicly resigned uh, from the organization. And she had this uh, unique ability, uh, uh, we are told, uh, to empathize with others' misfortune and uh, focus Americans' attention on unmet human needs. But these images, uh, though true, uh, I think are far from complete. They fail to capture her role in the rise of what we are calling tonight uh, big government during the war years. From roughly 1936 to 1945, she forged an approach that influenced FDR, shaped the debate about democracy, and informed post-war debates about government's proper role in society. Her liberalism, her vision, was based on fighting a government-led and citizen-powered war that echoes much of, uh, I think, what Jim uh, uh, was talking about on two equally uh, vital and interrelated fronts. First, from 1938 to 1941, while most Democrats shared FDR's desire to aid Britain and prepare for war, uh, she challenged isolationists, both on the anti-war Republican right, including America First, which was the nation's leading uh, isolationist uh, a group, and on the anti-war liberal left. She argued that the federal government must prioritize military defense and endorsed sending aid to the Allies and expanding America's military. She echoed and amplified FDR's warning in 1938 that new weapons of attack and new methods of warfare had shrunk time and distance uh, and made the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans much easier to cross for the nation's uh, enemies. Uh, the President warned that not only the coasts, but also the U U.S. interior 
uh, even in the Midwest, in places like Detroit or Chicago, was now for the first time uh, a battle zone. Eleanor Roosevelt assured that in future wars, all civilians would find themselves targets of enemy attacks and that, quote, gases in airplanes will not be directed only against armed forces or military centers. They may be used for the breaking of morale in the opposing nation. That will mean shelling of unfortified cities, towns, and villages, and the killing of women and children. In fact, this means the participation in war of entire populations, so this idea of, of total war. By the late 1930s, the First Lady decreed that without a government-backed arms expansion, the New Deal and even democracy could no longer uh, endure. She especially tried to bring the anti-war left, with which she was considered a leader uh, of this, to try to bring, pull the anti-war left into the military preparedness camp. She told one pacifist youth group in 1940 that uh, while, quote, I don't want to go to war and you don't want to go to war, war may come to us. She warned a thousand African-American congregates at a Washington, D.C. church that, quote, every time war goes back to Germany, that we are divided on the arms buildup, we are nailing one more nail in our coffin. She likened isolationists in the United States to Nazi appeasers. After the 1940 presidential campaign, she argued that if Wendell Wilkie had defeated her husband, democracy would have suffered enormously due to the Republican affinity for isolationism. Her pro-government views towards the international crisis also flowed from her convictions about the military's role in a democratic society in an age of total war. Uh, two of her sons volunteered for military service, and she repeatedly talked about in her columns uh, and in her radio talks about how they were directly in, in danger uh, and, and she feared for their lives because they wore the uniform. She saw the military as a repository of citizen action in democracy's defense. She toured sprawling army bases such as Fort Bragg in North Carolina where uh, she saw young America's patriotism, faith in liberty, and readiness to sacrifice and it inspired and, and impressed her. She supported new military spending and intervention as a guarantor of the nation's physical security. Uh, her faith in, in preparedness sent liberals a signal that a military buildup might not spell the end of the New Deal after all, as some liberals then feared. She helped make it permissible for some on the anti-war left to rally behind the administration's defense plans and insisted that only the federal government, that only big government could lead uh, uh, this fight, this struggle uh, uh, for military security. At the same time, her brand of liberalism rested on a second, second and equally important front in the fight against fascism. So while seeking to pull the anti-war left into the preparedness camp, she also fought to bring what we call today hawks uh, into the New Deal, or what she called at the time social defense camp. She called on government to put social defense on a par with military preparedness. Government ought to be, quote, as much interested today in seeing Americans well-housed, well-clothed, and well-fed, obtaining needed, needed medical, care, medical care and recreation as government is committed to military defense, she argued. A quote, wake up, every one of you, to the two fronts on which our defense must be built. In November 1941, she argued that World War II will bring us, and this is a month before Pearl Harbor, will bring us more education and the knowledge of what community needs really are and better organization within our communities to make every place in this country a better place in which to live and therefore more worth defending. The war to her was a fight to secure a better post-war future, which meant an expanded New Deal updated to meet wartime social needs. She called on government to work with citizens to set up daycare centers near defense plants, teach citizens about nutrition and their rights as consumers, uh, build and build decent housing for newly relocated war workers. In order to prevail, citizen morale had to be maintained. And Americans, the First Lady insisted, had to believe that their lives were better in a democracy than under a totalitarian regime because the fear that fascism would come to power in the United States uh, was real in, in some uh, corners of the country. And in the battle then for hearts around the globe, 
American democracy, she argued, had to show, had to demonstrate that it was a superior system of government than fascist slavery. Finally, social defense was going to improve the health of the population, equip more Americans to qualify for military service. She's constantly talking about uh, how 20-year-old uh, uh, potential GIs uh, fail their physical because they're, malnour they're malnourished. And, uh, and this is a, a constant theme, um, the connection between social and military defense. And she argued uh, uh, that social defense would make defense workers uh, more productive, thus fueling the, the sort of war machine. In January 1941, dozens of the nation's most influential women listened in the White House as she and her allies unveiled a plan to set up what she called the American Social Defense Administration. Under their plan, the government would provide volunteer roles for 50 million women, which is basically every adult uh, woman. And by the way, I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt at various times, uh, long before the start of, of the war, uh, proposed and talked about a universal national service. And at one point, she actually said, uh, if I keep talking about this, Mrs. Roosevelt's head will come off because FDR was, uh, did not want to go there. Um, so uh, uh, she, uh, so 50 million women who would work to improve uh, people's lives, advance the war effort. Uh, volunteers were going to uh, strengthen the education system, sanitation, public health, housing, and train women in skills so they could find good paying jobs. Five million women were going to cultivate gardens to feed their fellow citizens, and two million women would be trained in first aid and other emergency defense activities. Some women would police traffic in cities, while others would assist immigrants and teach 10 to 18 year old girls while all Americans, why all Americans had a responsibility to serve their country. FDR uh, blocked, however, blocked her plan because uh, his priority was securing uh, aid, uh, military and, and economic aid for Great Britain and he saw her proposal as too ambitious and too radical. During the war years overall, as, as Jim uh, uh, rightly uh, pointed out social defense, what she called social defense, or the New Deal, uh, took a backseat to military security. Uh, after 1938, FDR refused to support health care reform. His 1940 budget cut social spending and raised defense spending. In 1943, the Civilian Conservation Corps and National Youth Administration, both New Deal emblems, died. He did not believe in the end that guns and butter were fully compatible. Yet Eleanor Roosevelt uh, succeeded in helping, uh, uh, among other liberals, in helping cast the war as a struggle to ensure a government as concerned with people's welfare as it was with warfare. Her efforts uh, helped defend uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, New Deal's achievements, social security, labor rights, banking regulations, aid to the poor, and other New Deal programs which lasted into the Cold War and beyond. Um, you know, it was not uh, by 1938, 1939 uh, guaranteed that, that these programs were automatically uh, going to survive and, and remain intact. Um, her inf now, her influence, admittedly, though, is hard to uh, quantify. You know, she wasn't president, senator, or she wasn't a governor. She had no veto and no vote. Uh, but Eleanor Roosevelt did outline uh, her vision in her, uh, you know, Jim was talking uh, uh, really uh, incredibly uh, well about the, the mails and the different communications uh, media uh, of the White House. Um, she outlined her vision. She had a six day a week nationally syndicated column called My Day ran for years. I mean, it, it really is like a blog today, uh, but she was publishing it in, in, in scores of newspapers nationwide. She delivered a weekly radio address, gave countless talks to liberal and civic groups, spoke out in popular magazines, had a direct line to her husband, and replied to thousands of letters sent to her by leading liberals and ordinary uh, citizens alike. And there was this constant dialogue and she also just, she traveled uh, uh, constantly and, and was a constant presence uh, around the country. And, and you know, as much as you hear about the stories of, of, uh, of people writing to FDR and you know, as if he were a, a, an uncle or a friend, um, they did the same thing with Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, there was a kind of personal connection. Now obviously, you know, millions of people also uh, despise the Roosevelts, but uh, there was a real personal connection uh, 
uh, that, uh, that people uh, uh, felt towards her as much as they did, uh, I would argue, towards her husband. Uh, many liberals, such as Florence Kerr, Joseph Lash, and Eleanor Morgenthau, who was uh, uh, the Treasury Secretary's uh, wife, they put their faith in her leadership more than they did even in the presidents. They were more loyal to her uh, and her vision than they were to him. By December 1938, two-thirds of the public approved of the First Lady's performance. Uh, during the war year, she prodded FDR to defend the New Deal's gains and through her position in government secured appointments for her allies in the wartime administration. In 1941, when FDR announced his vision of freedom from want and fear, uh, which is, was in his uh, Four Freedoms Address, and then in 1944, as, as Jim mentioned, uh, when he issued his call for an economic bill of rights, uh, he was echoing, uh, yes, his, his ideas uh, and his vision. I mean, I think it was genuine to, to what he believed, but he was also channeling Eleanor Roosevelt's notion that social and military defense constituted the war's two fronts, this idea why we fight, um, and that there was a larger, a series of larger goals uh, and larger vision, which included, uh, 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 at its center, uh, a big government uh, operating in the, in the interest and spirit of uh, social justice. When FDR appointed her as Assistant Director of the Office of Civilian Defense in September 1941, which was the first time uh, the uh, wife of the country's chief executive had served in a formal uh, position, uh, in government. Now, the second time, uh, as far as I can tell, was uh, Hillary Clinton as head of the uh, health care task, for task force in, in 1993. Um, when FDR appointed her to that job, she led a program that ultimately recruited 11 million volunteers, including an estimated 3 million who performed some type of social defense role. Citizens working through their government fed women and children, provided medical and child care, trained defense plants workers, led salvage campaigns, uh, improved transit systems, planted victory gardens that, uh, that Jim referenced, and helped women learn about nutritious diets. The war did not uh, yield, obviously, everything uh, that the First Lady wanted it to provide. But her vision of national security and liberalism as compatible forces helped make it acceptable for liberals to champion big government both in terms of military affairs and social experimentation, a government devoted to both guns and butter. She helped foster th the tradition of projecting America's American values abroad by using government to ensure that America reflected its own founding principles. And these arguments would uh, echo uh, uh, during the Cold War when different uh, groups made claims to, to citizenship uh, and talked about uh, 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 the values and ideals embedded in the Constitution and, and domestic United States needs to reflect that if we're going to uh, wage this war for freedom against the Soviet uh, Union. ER's vision echoed in aspects of post-war liberalism uh, in ways that often are not well understood. Uh, FDR, Harry Truman, George Kennan, Adelaide Stevenson, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., John F. Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson have received the lion's share of credit and derision uh, as the fathers of big government. But elements of ER social defense ideals were expressed in Harry Truman's Fair Deal, John F. Kennedy's New Frontier, and Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, all of which rested in part on the notion that without achieving social democracy at home, the United States would be ill-equipped to project its values, freedom, opportunity, human rights, effectively uh, overseas. And you see international and domestic politics and the arguments around each uh, really feeding into one another. And that was something that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was not the only one, but I would argue that she helped pioneer it uh, 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 even before entry into the World War II. Just as ER had envisioned a grassroots wartime movement to improve life for all and bring the fruits of democracy to more Americans, so JFK's Peace Corps and LBJ's War on Poverty similarly asked citizens to partner with their government and engage with the issues of their time and take ownership, uh, oops, ownership over uh, the country's future. Even, uh, and this may be a bit of a stretch, but even uh, Barack Obama's idea that government must empower Americans to improve their own lives amid wars in Iraq and Afghanistan owes an unwinning debt to uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, legacy. 
Her expansive vision that the federal government must be both military protector and social advocate remains part of our ongoing debate about government's proper role in international and domestic affairs. And so again, you know, I want to stress that uh, you know, she was not the only one, but I do think she was one of the early uh, 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 advocates uh, of this idea that, that the government uh, can, should, and, and really must, has a kind of moral responsibility uh, uh, to do both. And so uh, I would just leave you with uh, uh, the idea that we are still living in Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, shadow. James and Matt, thank you so much for such stimulating talks. We have uh, some time for uh, questions from the audience. And um, Brian, um, Franklin has a microphone here. He's going to, oh, I'm sorry. Tim. <laughs> So we'll pass it around. We have one here. With respect, with respect to Eleanor Roosevelt, can you elaborate on her role in the uh, formation of the GI Bill, as well as the settlement of the uh, Motorman strike in Philadelphia? Uh, I can't specifically speak to those. I mean, I don't think she was, uh, you know, I haven't seen evidence that she was a major player uh, involved in uh, formulating the GI Bill. Um, but, you know, I will say that she was uh, a very powerful advocate on behalf of not just veterans, but um, the 20 plus, I think, million, mostly men, but also some women who were in uniform. And at one point, she was sending to, I think it was George Marshall, uh, so many, forwarding so many letters uh, from parents of GIs uh, about conditions that they were facing, their lack of boots or, or the housing condition. He brought two people on staff to help him deal with all, all of the letters. So she was a fierce advocate uh, for, uh, especially the men who were serving in uniform. And so this idea, uh, of service, of, of national service, of military service in particular, um, that, that people were then giving up and sacrificing, but that they then deserved in return uh, something from their government on behalf of their service. I think that was very much woven through, uh, through her, uh, her arguments, and I think it did kind of shape, and again, I don't want to give her all the credit because obviously uh, many others were and this speaks to, I think, what Jim was talking about as well, but, but she certainly uh, laid that argument out very powerfully uh, during the war. As to the strike, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know her role. We have back there. We are here. Do you know if there was any uh, evidence of espionage that could be traced back to an overheard conversation or uh, something coming from the factory workers? That's an excellent one. Can you hear me? Huh? <laughs> I'll just project. Uh, that's an excellent question. No. <laughs> the, 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 um, I have a document in my possession <laughs> uh, on my hard drive. Um, I actually have it. Uh, it shows uh, the FBI director, Jacob Hoover, acknowledging that of the millions of contacts and suggestions that came in, especially through the uh, industrial security program, where veterans would listen and overhear and report any contacts, not just rumors, but anything, of, of all those reports that came in, zero cases of sabotage or any kind of fifth column activity whatsoever were uncovered by the, uh, the, the FBI's uh, contact program. This is by citizens who were deputized to report to the FBI. 
They did, however, uncover over 300,000 citizens who had not uh, registered properly for the draft until the copy draft, <laughs> reported by their neighbors. Um, and, so that, and so in the memo, who, uh, Hoover emphasizes how important this was, but he also frankly said, look, this program is really more about political support among veterans. It hasn't actually been an asset when it comes to uh, espionage and, and, uh, and, and surveillance. Um, but for Hoover, that was perfectly legitimate to create a citizenry that was alerted to the dangers of internal subversion, which Hoover was convinced was everywhere. And if I could just uh, add to, so, I mean, fifth columnists, which were a big, the fear of fifth columnists, a big deal in World War I, uh, remain very much on the minds, not just Hoover, but, you know, really across the government. And, and, yeah, I mean, the Roosevelt, you know, everyone, and actually Eleanor Roosevelt even at one point uh, after uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, while she was uh, saying, she was defending um, uh, Japanese Americans and defending that they have rights as citizens, she also said, you know, if you see something or hear something, please do report it to your local FBI. So this was part of the language and, and culture of the times. The other thing I'll say uh, is that as much as, as some officials uh, feared or were obsessed with this sort of you know, rumors and internal security threats, there was an even greater fear um, of much of it overblown, but a greater fear that airplanes were going to attack. Uh, and, and it sounds, you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, 1938, 1930, but, but this idea of fascist militarism, targeting of civilians, married to super bombers of the future, many government officials and, and many in the public believe that, I mean, FDR actually in, uh, I think February 19, early 1942, a couple months after Pearl Harbor said, Detroit, uh, New York could be bombed tonight, Detroit could be bombed tomorrow night. And of course that is precisely, became the, precisely the foundation of American military power during and after World War II, yeah. air power and firebombing uh, during the war and then uh, atomic air power after the war. So the concerns about civilian defense and, and, uh, and the dangers of total war were, were real. Um, and FDR did not hesitate to insist that the five German saboteurs who washed up on the shores of Long Island in the summer of 1942 be hung summarily. They were given a military trial and then they were hung. But um, so the Roosevelts were not soft on saboteurs. <laughs> Yeah, it, it seems to me that uh, President Roosevelt was very shrewd in when the war began in separating the New Deal from the war effort. His, his famous comment about I'm no longer Dr. New Deal, I'm Dr. from the war. Could you comment on the role of the war in dampening the political opposition to the New Deal, which has been pretty consistent ever since the New Deal. Can you, can you comment about that? Well, uh, yeah, uh, my quick comment is that I don't think the opposition, I think it was muted, but it did not totally uh, uh, fade away. And in fact, uh, uh, some uh, Republican critics uh, attacked certain New Dealers as being, you know, communist and being too left and trying to inject sort of radical New, New Deal ideas into the war program. Um, so just to give you one example that involves Eleanor Roosevelt, I didn't get into it in my talk, but uh, she was appointed, as I said, Assistant Director of this Office of Civilian Defense. Uh, in early February 1942, it was learned uh, by Congress and then reported in the newspapers that she had hired a dancer uh, her friend Mayris Cheney, uh, and an actor, Melvin Douglas, uh, both of whom were, were basically friends of hers, uh, put them on the payroll uh, to lead uh, acting and uh, a dancing, teach children uh, to dance. as a morale, uh, uh, which had been done during World War I, um, and, but that uh, she or that this office was paying, uh, at least Cheney, paying her $4,600 a year, which was the same salary as, say, generals, some generals were making. There was, uh, uh, it became a huge, really the, the, the first uh, major, as far as I can tell, political firestorm after Pearl Harbor. And the criticism, the linking of kind of her, uh, the attacks on her is trying to revive the New Deal, expand the New Deal through a back door, 
um, were even among some of FDR's allies. Uh, uh, you heard those uh, very, uh, you know, very loudly. And, uh, and so I don't think it ever kind of faded away. At the same time, um, you know, I'll be curious to hear what Jim says about this, but while some of the programs like the CCC, the NYA, uh, were cut, um, others became more woven, I think, into the ex expected fabric uh, of American society and that the debate, for example, uh, uh, about Social Security and, and other uh, things passed during the, the so-called First and Second New Deal, those things, there wasn't much of a, a, a serious effort to, to uh, cut those things. Um, so I would uh, agree and disagree uh, both. Uh, liberal position. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and so the uh, disagreement would be that I, my view of this, and this is not the mainstream historical view, this is, I, I, I'm developing a, uh, an argument for a book that is critical of the mainstream view. Most historians would agree with exactly how you've described the, the outcome of the New Deal. I would say that in fact, the war, far from dampening opposition to the New Deal, cemented its success. And by 1943, it wasn't just the CCC and the NYA that were eliminated, but the WPA, the heart and soul, the reason why millions of people were New Deal voters was because they had jobs to the WPA. <clears throat> it was a vast program. Um, and it was also the ideological heart and soul of the New Deal as well. And it was the thing that the anti-New Dealers went after first in the, in, in, uh, in the Hatch Act, for example, in the attack on the WPA theater. The WPA should have been the agency that could have built the infrastructure of the war effort, but it wasn't. Um, and in fact, the Department of the Interior also had to kind of retool away from New Deal reform programs toward more purely infrastructure programs. The TVA became a big electric utility, which is ironic given its origins in public utility law. And it became a big defense contractor for Alcoa. It provided electricity for Alcoa. And then the entire atomic sector rested on hydropower and the Bonneville Dam and the TVA. So in fact, I see the war as really transforming the New Deal. And that in the parts of the New Deal that survived, that we call the New Deal order, in fact, were very different from what they had been uh, in the 1930s. So Social Security is a classic example. What we think of as Social Security did not exist until the 1950 revisions. So I would argue it's really a creature of the Cold War. Now, this is not to take credit away from the 30s when the original vision was outlined, particularly the insurance principle. Um, but if you look at how the coverage operated, it became a universal middle class program in 1950, those revisions. Prior to that, welfare for the elderly outstripped payments of Social Security by a factor of four. Social Security was not liked. It was not very popular. Congress would never authorize the, the matching contribution. Um, it was only when, it, the, when the revisions were passed in 1950 that you really get what we call Social Security, when we use that as a shorthand for old age um, insurance. I could go through all of the New Deal. Labor uh, policy goes from militancy to wartime arbitration. It's a profound shift, and the Taft-Hartley Act just simply institutionalizes that. Planning, no more planning, no more 1930-style planning after 19. 40, what you get is military planning, and on a vast scale, reconstructing Germany, reconstructing Japan, building an entire sector of the US economy around the, around the defense economy. So I, I don't want to take up too much time here, but what I would argue is war actually selectively preserved and transformed what we call the New Deal. And the things that were essential to getting people to vote for the New Deal and support the New Deal were either eliminated or retooled. Now that's a revisionist argument, and I, and I realize there, you know, uh, so I don't want to like overemphasize it. it. There is no question, however, that this is where we agree, that the, um, the defense of activist government, the idea that society had to be defended in order to preserve national security, and the internationalization of this vision, at least rhetorically, if not always in practice, all of those things were part of a liberal effort to preserve, it, preserve the New Deal vision in a Cold War. So what I would say is, Rather than a guns and butter situation, which is what Johnson was uh, pursuing, what we got was a guns as butter situation, military Keynesianism, which did produce full employment, which did produce redistribution of income, which produced a lot of the things New Dealers wanted, but they didn't necessarily want it that way, and I don't think Eleanor wanted it that way either. Yeah, and, and you know, just to kind of briefly follow up, I mean, 
there are a lot of debates about well, what is the New Deal even, and you know how many New Deals are there, and sort of the idea of New Deal liberalism transforming over time. So you know, I agree with with a lot of that. The other thing is, you know, the war in some ways addresses some of the economic problems that the New Deal was uh, designed to address, and and you know, really economic uh, uh, you know output and production uh, takes off, and so uh, you know, if you look at, at say if you think about government. As providing jobs and and you know fueling uh, economic, uh, albeit through very different means, um, you know there there is some connection there. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, the last thing I'll say is that you know arguably the war, uh, even though it's seen as kind of this high tide of big government that we're talking about, you know, one thing that at least I didn't mention is that in some ways maybe it deepens the opposition to big government and intensifies it that you know, we continue to see being played out today because as government encroaches and expands, the opposition becomes intensified and things like Frederick Hayek's uh, uh, The Road to Serfdom and, and other ideas uh, begin to take, take root, deeper root. Oh, so come here. Sure. Okay, I'll go to you. Yes, thank you for your comments tonight. I'm interested in the leadership that he showed uh, prior to Pearl Harbor and how he, he had a very difficult situation in trying to get prepared for what he knew was the, on, the onset of the war with the climate in the country and then the leadership and relationships that he had with uh, Churchill and, and Stalin. Have either of you written anything in that area or do you have a publication that you would recommend to, uh, that would focus on those kind of uh, issues on his leadership? Um, so uh, in my book, The uh, Warfare State, the, the first chapter and some portions of the second chapter talk about Roosevelt's efforts to, um, uh, to maneuver uh, public opinion toward acceptance of, of uh, war. And, um, and in particular, it talks about the problem of framing intervention because the opponents of Roosevelt weren't simply opposed to, <clears throat> you know, his tax, the soak the rich tax message, or the Public Utilities Holding Company Act, or the Wagner Act, in other words, domestic policy. Those opponents formed an alliance with people who the Roosevelt administration called isolationists, people who didn't want intervention in the war. Now, there were some isolationists on the left, and they began to part way with Roosevelt precisely to the extent that he was beginning to make moves toward um, intervention in the war. But he picked up conservatives who were pro-preparedness. And so what I look at is Roosevelt's <clears throat> use of this sort of imagery and language of fighting a war against the Depression to apply now to fascist, international fascism. And, and the difficulty of doing that, that it wasn't easy as, as easy as you would think, because in fact those signals are actually referring to particular constituencies, and also <clears throat> fighting a depression is not the same thing as fighting a war, um, and you know particularly the number of people who end up dead, are, you know, is 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 different. So um, there's that portion, and then the book that I'm working on now, which is not out, but uh, hopefully will be out in, in you know maybe a year and a half, has a much larger discussion about that relationship to those constituencies, because you have to remember. Um, millions of the people who voted for Roosevelt in the 30s. So African Americans who used to be Republicans in the early 30s and then were stalwart Democrats by the end of the 30s were concerned about uh, Ethiopia. Suddenly, uh, uh, you know, they're very pro-intervention. And um, millions of Germans who remembered World War I uh, were staunch isolationists, particularly in the, in the Midwest. Not all, but, but a very large. And many of those Germans, especially in places like Milwaukee, you know, areas around where I, I live now in Chicago, uh, were working class voters who, who had supported Roosevelt around union, or union, bread and butter union issues. Italian Americans had a similar. So the coming of geopolitical conflict posed big problems for the so called New Deal coalition. And so that's in this book that isn't out yet, but will be soon. And I would just add one quick thing. Um, you know, Roosevelt gives a series of fireside chats and speeches in, I would say, the 1938 to 1940 
uh, period. And, and just one in particular, uh, he goes to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, and he creates an image. Uh, you know, Jim was talking about other you know, images, how you would use images and examples. He talks about the United States, uh, if I think Great Britain uh, is defeated, if France is defeated, the United States will be basically like a prisoner locked in a cage and its master will have to feed its breadcrumbs, something like that, you know, that, that it will be because Germany will, and the fear of the, the British Navy um, uh, being defeated and giving Hitler, in particular, uh, access to the United, you know, the Atlantic uh, with no barrier, and this idea that the United States will be surrounded uh, by, by its enemies was very much uh, a theme uh, throughout, and 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 you know he used it, I think, uh, quite powerfully, despite facing all of this intense opposition that that Jim described. And so, you know, I would take a look at some of his chats and, and speeches. I mean, they're they're very powerful. A concrete example of that that's in uh, um, in Warfare State is um, the quarantine the aggressor speech, which Roosevelt famously gave after the Japanese invasion of China in the late 1930s. It was a lesson for Roosevelt that it produced a backlash, an isolationist backlash, and so he went much more slowly uh, in pursuing uh, ways around neutrality legislation. But that's also where he started to learn that he could portray fascists as, as um, gangsters. And this was an imagery that had worked in the war on crime that made the FBI so popular in the 1930s. Um, and he used the same rhetoric, the same imagery, the same tropes and language to authorize uh, things like Lend-Lease, you know, which were much more expensive, by the way, than the FBI. <clears throat> I mean, we spent $50 billion on Lend-Lease, which is more than all New Deal welfare spending in the 30s combined. Um, but that, that imagery of a war on crime that was international stuck, and it worked across political boundaries, whereas the quarantine, the aggressor used public health imagery, a quarantine, and that was, you know, that actually just set off alarm bells. Oh. Could we thank our guests once more? It's terrific. And thank you all for coming very much.